Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Martin Lindstrom. Grace Under Pressure is an interview show where we pose questions to thinkers and doers like Martin, who are changing our world for the better. Grace Under Pressure reveals what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, you know, the caring, the connecting, the commitment. And when you do it as a leader, as Martin is in his company and with his clients, um, it's all about bringing people together for common cause. Martin, it's a pleasure to, wel uh, to welcome you to the show today. So. Thank you, John. What a pleasure to be here. I like your background. Where are you in that room? <laughs> well, this is a, a photographic green screen, but it's at the University of Michigan. Don't uh, say that. Just make me believe that that's your sort of the <laughs> arrival lobby into your new house, right? Yeah, <laughs> great. Anyway, I want to tell folks about you, Martin. Uh, Martin Lindstrom is the founder and chairman of the Lindstrom Company, Imaginative name, isn't it? <laughs> the really, I needed a lot of creativity here. <laughs> <laughs> but you are creative because it's the world's leading brand and culture transformation group. Uh, it works in five different continents. Time magazine named Martin one of the world's most influential people. Get it? <laughs> wow. Uh, and for three years running, I think it's 50, the world's premier ranking source of business leaders has ranked Martin at the very top. Uh, you've had seven New York Times bestsellers. Trans your books have been translated into 60 languages. Uh, your uh, newest book is what we're going to talk about today, A Ministry of Common Sense. And Martin, welcome. So. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quote and I did a little, uh, I love this book so much, I did a little video about it. And I opened it with, I said, you don't just read Martin Lindstrom, you laugh with Martin Lindstrom. The Ministry of Information is a laugh riot. It's also a great book and an insightful book. So Martin, what provoked you to read, to uh, write this book? <laughs> I think that we've gone to an all-time low where common sense kind of had disappeared. There's multiple stories which led me to do this, but one of them was when I was spending time in a bank um, and I went to 18th floor and I spoke to this lady. She was head of compliance, very serious lady. And I said to her, hey, listen, tell me, um, what you must have produced a lot of rules. And she looked at me, she said, absolutely. And I didn't expect her to say that. She said, absolutely. I produced 1,236 rules. <laughs> and I thought it was kind of a joke for a moment here. Uh, so she, she got it. So she took this yellow page book sized rule book and slammed it on my lap. And she said, here you go. <laughs> and I started to flick through all these different pages. And I arrive at page 200 and something, right? And at 200 page something, there's a rule. And the rule is basically saying, hey, um, if you have a contract signed, always make sure you email it, make sure you send it, and always make sure you fax it. So I said to her, listen, this rule is sort of kind of recent. It works right now. And don't you sort of get rid of some rules? I'm thinking this is quite a lot. She said, no, 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 that's not my job. My job is to produce rules. If someone want to get rid of it, it has to be someone else because I'm not destroying my own job. <laughs> and that, I mean, this is the type of stories you hear in, in the corporate world today. And it's not a one-off story. There's hundreds of those stories. And at some stage, you have to ask yourself, why are we here with statistics now showing that up to 80% of the employee force today feel that they're miserable at work. Uh, we know from our studies that around 45% of the time people spend every day is basically occupied or, or basically conquered by red tape, bureaucracy and BS. Then my question is, first of all, is this motivating? Do you really want to waste well, one third of your life on that stuff? And, and second, that is, what is the benefit of this? And and it's really becomes this stretchjacket killing us. So I felt this was the moment to go back in time and say, let's bring back common sense one for no, once of all, because it really is desperately needed at the moment. Right. Well, you open the story in the book that about the uh, IT. How often have we uh, encountered a problem with IT, and then your computer is down, and then it says visit IT. <laughs> and, and you have another more recent story about um, signing forms on an airplane. Do you want to share that with us? <laughs> yeah, I do. 
Well, it's 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 happening everywhere. It, it, no, I jumped on a plane the other day and wanted to go back home. And as I took a seat uh, on the plane, this announcement came on the on the speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board of this plane. I regret to inform you that all cabin service has been completely suspended on the entire flight. And by the way, the laboratories in the front of the cabin has been closed. They are exclusively now reserved for the cabin crew. If you want to use the laboratories, you're welcome to use the one laboratory in the back of the plane. Now, let's just, John, I just want to put this into perspective. There's 131 passengers on board of this plane. I was at row two. So I literally had to walk by every one of the 33 rows and line up in a line bigger than the TSA waiting line uh, somewhere in JF Kennedy's airport. And here I'm standing, breathing in this freshly brewed, a smell of toilet mixed up with a faint whiff of COVID-19. <laughs> um, and if that wasn't enough, then on top of that, we then take a seat in the plane and this new format of entertainment systems is introduced. Never thought about it like this, but you know, in the old days, you at least had movies and stuff. Now that has been closed down because of COVID. Don't ask me why and how that works, but it doesn't work anymore. So they introduced this new type of entertainment system, which is called a track and tracing contact form. <laughs> and it's, you know, if you know the old days, they had a sort of a more amateurish version when you're going to a new country, you had to fill in some Christians, which no one would read anyway. But anyway, we did it for entertainment sakes. Now we have another form, version 3.9, I think it is, where the first question in the form is something like, have you been in close proximity with anyone over the last 12 hours, which you don't know. And the only thing you have to do is basically just do this thing here and get the name of this passenger sitting next to you and her phone number so you can, of course, put it on the form. Um, and then the second question is even worse. And before I tell you what the second question is, you know, we don't have pens on planes anymore because we have iPhones and iPads. Sure. So, of course, filling out a form is tricky. Now, guess what? One passenger is incredibly brilliant. He decides to borrow a pen from the purser. Purser's nice, hands over the pen for the plane. And then he walks through all 118 passengers, lending up with me. So here I have this pen so I can fill out the form. And guess what the second question is? The second question is, have you taught anything anyone had taught over the last 12 hours. <laughs> and once again, I basically, I do this one here and I just tick the box, right? Because that's that's really, you know, <laughs> that's the answer, right? <laughs> right. Oh, that's crazy, you know. And, you know, and, and these stories make us laugh, but actually, um, well, they should provoke us, and that's why your book is so insightful. They pro provoke us to think. But I think you have a premise that the lack of common sense is due to lack of empathy. Am I correct? So. You're absolutely uh, correct, John. And, and you're correct in the way that if we were to define what <laughs> common sense stands for, it really, well, it consists of two words, sense and common. And common means from multiple points of views. But if I was to define empathy, it's your ability to place yourself in the shoes of another person and feel what that person is feeling. So guess what's happening? The correlation between common sense and empathy is pretty profound. In fact, the more empathy you have in an organization, the more common sense you have. And this really brings me back to a, a pretty disturbing observation. In fact, I just spoke to Gary Ritz, which is, as you know, the CEO of C of, of WD40. Terrific. And yeah. yeah, he's a wonderful guy. I just had him on my show about an hour ago. And he said to me that that uh, ego eats uh, empathy for breakfast. And, and it's true because here's where we are. We have become so obsessed with ourselves. And there's multiple reasons why. I think one of them is these self-fulfilling bubbles we have on social media, which is reaffirming whatever view I had to the world, that's the number one view, right? So what we see happening now is that we as a species are slowly changing. And if I was to bring you back in time, you will notice, I guess, some 100,000 years ago, our brain had not developed 
to the extent it has today. So what scientists have discovered since then is that the evolution of the brain also is the reason why we as a species have survived because we actually had an activation in an area called the supermarginal gyrus, which is in the cerebral cortex. And this is an area which is representing, guess what, empathy. Now, that area is the reason why we survived because I could put myself into the shoes of a, I guess, a polar bear. Which is not wearing shoes, by the way, but just <laughs> myself, and and really try to experience what that polar bear was doing, so we could sort of anticipate what is likely to happen. But what is really frightening around all this stuff is that due to social media, due to our instant gratification generation, the fact that we have no patience whatsoever to wait for anything anymore. So it's two hundred eighty characters on Twitter. It basically is yes and no on black and white. Well, due to that, we now are seeing for the first time in living memory that empathy levels are falling. And according to a study by University of Michigan, among 14,000 students, <laughs> yeah, exactly, we're seeing that empathy levels now have dropped some 48% over a decade. Yeah. Brain scans are showing that the brain is changing its structure. And with that, empathy is disappearing. And remember, empathy is the ability to see the world from another point of view. Well, if that disappears, common sense disappears. And that's the reason why this book, in my opinion, is so profound, because we need to we need to, to save empathy before it's too late, in my opinion, right? You have a great way of provoking an understanding of customers and empathy uh, in your company. And you told a wonderful story about one, a pharmaceutical you worked with that, um, tell us about the straw example. What was yeah. that? Well, listen, um, this uh, company, which is one of the largest players in the respiratory field, um, actually uh, said to me, hey, we want to get closer to our patients and can you help us? So I said, absolutely. And the first question I asked them was, uh, when did you last spend time with your patients? Expecting to hear, you know, a pretty extensive story around this. Remember, they've been around for almost 100 years. And the answer was, never. <laughs> never? Yeah. Yeah. never. <laughs> and so they said to me, well, uh, compliance won't allow it. Anyway, as you know, my book is all about the word BS. Uh, so I said, BS. And I went to compliance, persuaded them to, uh, to pr give us permission to, you know, go into the patient's homes. So a true story, I end up in a, in a patient home. She's a 20-year-old lady, and I have two um, observers with me from the pharma company, and she's had asthma her entire life. So I asked her one of these questions, which I think was pretty profound. I said to her, how was it to have asthma as a child? And she starts to cry. And I, uh, I'm actually pretty taken by it. So I said, well, what happened? She talks about how she was cheesed in school, how she had no friends, how she was when she was invited to parties, how she was a disgrace for human mankind. This is a quote from her. Oh. Uh, obviously, she was just very taken by it. And, and I, of course, I understand that. So I said to her, listen, it looks like you have you know, pretty strong self-confidence today. How come? And she grabs her hand back and she pulls out, rightly as you're saying, a straw. And I say to her, so what's the story about this straw? And she says, well, I always give this straw to my friends, new friends, colleagues, and I ask them to hold themselves from the nose and breathe through this straw. And immediately there's an exchange of empathy because then they finally feel how I feel every minute of my life. So I took this story uh, and I teamed up with the senior management in this company to so have the whole board showing up. And um, I'll never forget it because I decided to shut down the light in the whole room. We had speaker playing the sound of a person with heavy respiratory problems like this. <gasps> that type of sound, very disturbing. And then I handed out the straw and I had everyone hold themselves from the nose and do this exercise for a minute. And after... 30 seconds, one guy, he spits out the straw and he says, this is absolutely ridiculous. No one can live like this. And I look him in his eye and I say to him, this is how your patients feel like every minute of their entire life. 
and they are the ones paying your salary. And you could actually feel almost like a penny drop on the floor. And what happened as a consequence of that was a lot of things. One of them was we developed an empathy kit where new people onboarding into this huge organization all would have a straw and other tools to put themselves in the shoes of a, a respiratory disease problem. Um, but also uh, they started to employ people differently. R&D behave differently. Marketing saw the world from a different point of view. And what I'm trying to say here is that empathy is an incredible, powerful tool to align um, silos and divisions uh, within the organizations and change the point of view from an inside-out point of view to an outside-in point of view, right? That's very powerful because, there, <coughs> excuse me, never in my experience, or maybe all of us right now in the pandemic and the economic crisis and social isolation that we feel, has there been a greater need for empathy? And research shows, what do you want from your leaders? And it's empathy. And as you, and this is the what your why your book is so important, because I like to say that it's not enough for a leader to have empathy. He or she must act on empathy. And that's why your work is so important, Martin, because you provoke you. it and you you change your work changes perceptions and people act on it so well th thank you for your compliment he, here's what i've learned we live in a in a time right now where i don't think we're smiling a lot and i don't think we're laughing a lot um we know from all <laughs> <laughs> every time i watch you i smile or i laugh <laughs> <laughs> I, th this is very interesting by the way because there's a study done some years ago um which were reported later on in the BBC about seven years ago, which shows why the popular kids in school are popular. And it actually showed using neuroscience that um, kids which are popular typically makes other kids laugh. So why are they more popular, the study showed? Well, they're more popular because when you laugh, it gives you more oxygen to your brain. It gives you more energy. So subconsciously, we then really are drawn to people which makes you laugh. And that was actually one of my base philosophies when writing the Ministry of Common Sense because I wanted to go against the, the, the dark view we have of our planet right now and make people laugh um, and then make people cringe. And I think through laughter, you actually can convey a message in a much more powerful way than having this thing here throughout the whole thing. So I'm trying to use laughter as a weapon to, to point the gun as, at us and 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 make everyone say, do you know what? What if he's right? What what if I change? And that's the reason why it's such an important book for me because what I've learned through this process is a very interesting uh, observation. I'll, I'll share that with you. So an experiment was conducted with chickens. They're put into a cage and stocked into a cage for half a year. And one day they're let out on the beautiful green grass and the sun was shining and the birds were singing. And the chickens went straight out. And guess what? After 30 seconds, they went straight back in again. And I call that the chicken cage syndrome. Yeah. And one of the things I'm very focused on is that we do not change because we're afraid of the unknown. And the other thing I always have learned when I do transformation of organizations across the world is we do not change because we're waiting for other people to change first. And once he has changed and she certainly has to change and that department, and if we fix the legal, and by the way, if compliance can stand up, then I'll, of course, I'm the first to change. Yeah. But what I've learned is this, and I'll, I'll just see if I can illustrate that in, in a fun way. So if you imagine you have, um, let's say, four chicken cages seen from the very top. So imagine these chicken cages are standing around a square, right? And I would be very nice to the chickens now, so I'll open the the uh, the doors out to the beautiful green grass here. Now, what business leaders typically are doing when they do all this stuff is that they typically are saying, well, if I want to have the chickens coming out on the beautiful green grass, I want to give them an equal chance. So let me place the corn in the very center here, right? But this is what's so fascinating. What happens here, and John, I need to have your help here. What happens if I'm a chicken here now looking out on this corn, and I tell you there is a really big dis distance from that piece of corn to that chicken cage. What am I likely to do in that process? 
I'll stick my neck through it. So. You will stick your neck out. That's right. And you will now conclude two things. My God, this is far away. If I translate that into corporate speak, I'm basically saying my KPIs are not supporting this, so why should I? And the second question I probably will ask is something like, my God, this is dangerous. Translate it to another language. It basically is, if what if my manager is being fired? I'll be standing there in the middle looking like a complete jerk, right? <laughs> so what 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 am I doing now from a piece of psychology point of view? The first thing I'm basically doing is I'm looking at the other chickens, right? And chicken one is looking at chicken two, and chicken two is looking at chicken three, and chicken three at, at four. And look at me, look at you, look at me, look at you. Everyone is in panic here. And what do they do? They all conclude that's bloody far away. So they will go straight back into the chicken cage again. So what I've learned through our transformation work around the world is don't place the corn in the center. Place it just outside the chicken cage here. So I, as a chicken, can take it. I can eat it. I can enjoy the corn. And the other chickens will look at me and say, wow, that looks wonderful. And see, nothing happened. I'll try too. And suddenly you will see that the sense of belonging is kind of driving the transformation within the organization. And that's actually what I call a 90-day intervention. It's a slow transformation step by step taking place, 90 days at a time, generating a success feeling, which of course you are celebrating within the organization. And as a consequence of that, you really are changing the organization through a culture movement, right? That's wonderful. And it, you know, it, <laughs> uh, st to state the obvious, Martin, it's common sense, is it not? <laughs> That's true, but common sense is sadly not that common as one That's person is quoted I to ask you, And I'm not trying to be a jerk when I ask this. The people you work with um, and companies, they are successful. They're not stupid. But why do we get wrapped up in a lack of common sense? What's happening? So. Well, we drink of the Kool-Aid. And, and I think I think we all tried it uh, in, in one way or another. I'm going to quote a movie which you may recall. It's, it's a little bit old. It's called The Wave. Did you ever see The Wave? I think so, yeah. Yeah, it was a fascinating movie uh, where a student in the class is saying um, to the teacher when they have history, how come people under the Second World War in Germany actually bought up to Nazism and actually turn around to become very evil people during the Second World War. Why didn't it just say stop? And this guy in this fascinating movie, it's only 30 minutes long. You can actually download it free of charts on YouTube. Um, this guy is saying, um, that's a really good question. Let me think about it. And he comes back the day after and he does this experiment and where he changes the perception of reality around people. And suddenly people actually become like mini Hitlers and start to try to kill each other and it really becomes bad. And it's actually based on a true story. And what is fascinating about this, as frightening as it is, is the fact that we always sign up to a tribe. We are in a tribe right now. Yes. In the old days, it was called a tie or a hat. Or today, you have a smartphone. Or I say hello in a certain way. Or even right now, when I'm using the word BS, I wouldn't dare, bow, I wouldn't dare saying bullshit. Uh, of course, I would never say bullshit. I would always say BS because the culture is dictating us saying that. And actually, it's even worse because I haven't told you this, John, but <laughs> this is crazy. Amazon have banned my book from advertising. You can still buy the book on Amazon. On Amazon. I just want to say that. But I'm not allowed to advertise on, on Amazon. And do you know why? Ah. Because... I'm using the word B-U-L-L-S, which is offensive for the algorithms at Amazon. So I said to the algorithms, no, I'm, I'm talking to algorithms on a daily basis. Yeah. <laughs> my friend, right? so I said to them, well, why don't we take the tape and just move it? The whole, so it's just become, so we just covered all of it. And the algorithms, no, no, no. They came back to me and they said to me at Amazon, do you know what? That's a good idea, but if people order the book and they see this frightening word of bulls, right? When they see that, they will complain, they will sue Amazon because that was not what they bought. Common sense. So what I'm saying here I, is I have that, to interrupt here. I'm wondering if the woman that you told us about who wrote the rules now works at Amazon. <laughs> it's funny you're saying it. She actually have installed her own little robot in there walking around. It's really busy, I tell you. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, this is, you no. Know, if Charlene Lee, our colleague, is seeing this, uh, she will laugh because she 
wrote a book called was it disrupt yourself yes. disrupt something and uh, disrupt the word disrupt was banned by facebook so she couldn't advertise on facebook she told me the other day <laughs> oh <my God>. That's <laughs> crazy. i'm derailing here what i'm saying is we've created what's called invisible straight jackets around ourselves it's unspoken rules it's rules like when you go to the office you have to be before your boss and you always wait until he go home first then you leave later on all that stuff and those unspoken rules become tighter and tighter because the company is afraid of losing what it already has and that means you put a safety net around it compliance rules regulations guidelines red tape all that stuff and suddenly the reality is changing so instead of you seeing the world from outside in i.e from a patient's point of view a customer or a client's point of view you start to see the world from inside out that means what is right for us we always done it that way. We tried that idea, Martin, five years ago. It did not work. Compliance will not give you the permission to do that. Do you know what? Next year, perhaps. Yeah. That type of arguments are taking our mindset and polluting us, right? There's a You just echoed a, one of my very favorite quotes from an author that just passed away, Jean Le Claret, um, yeah. uh, who wrote in one of his uh, novels, A Desk is a dangerous place from which to view the world. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. that's totally inside out, you know. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to put you on a, on the spot here, Martin, because you're such a, a bold thinker. So if you were named tomorrow czar of the world, what's one thing we could do to gain common sense? So. Well, it's funny because I'm writing an update in the New York Times about that very topic. Um, and and what I'm saying is, let's install a ministry of common sense in the new administration, uh, <laughs> because in the end of the day, what I think is happening is that bureaucracy has become so complex that we just can't see the forest for just trees. And in fact, I want to be inspired by another country. So the Republic of Georgia, which is a very small country based in Europe, in the eastern part of Europe, um, in fact, installed or have set up these type of community centers across the country in almost every city uh, uh, across the whole region and there you can go in and do everything in 30 minutes supposedly so you can if you want to be married 30 minutes if you want to be divorced 30 minutes if you want to have a new car license 30 minutes if you want to set up a new company 30 minutes whatever you say 30 minutes and it works it works this is the place now that is common sense for me and i would say there's the best thing you can do is in our life is to reduce frictions on your day-to-day -day basis because that is causing a lot of pain. It gives people diseases. You know, we go down with stress. We get anxiety. So the first thing I'll do probably would be to set up a ministry of common sense in, in the new administration in the United States. Uh, I think that will then inspire, inspire a lot of companies and countries around the world. Another thing I'll do is what's happening in Denmark, which is Northern Europe. Um, and in, in this country, country, correct. It is my native. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> it's a six million people. It's where Hans Christian Andersen came from. And and there is something rotten going on in the state of um, is also from there. And that's where you have Lego, of course. I know your son loves Lego. So that's my son was, yes, as a young man, as a as a boy. He's now all grown up. <laughs> no, stop. Hang on. Stop, don't say that. I'm going to show you something. Yeah. Give your son this next time. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is for adults as well. It's pretty amazing, right? You can yeah, do this. It's amazing. Right? It is amazing. Yeah. But, but what, what you know, they've done in Denmark now is that they have started up classes in the public school for the toddlers, which is teaching them about empathy. And this is this is another very profound insight because empathy is like a muscle. If you train it, you get it more. If you don't use it, it disappears. Um, and if you don't build it in from the very childhood, the ability to hug people, which we don't do anymore, yeah. to be close proximity with people, to listen actually, we don't do that anymore, mm -hmm. and to react on based on what we're learning. If you don't build it in from childhood memories, uh, if we instead are just following the, the, 
the brainwashing going on from the Facebooks of the world, telling you the whole world is about you, then I think what's going to happen is that we actually are ending up in a situation where it will disappear. And we talked about that early on, then we'll lose that skill set. So that will be the second action, to building classes around the world, teaching um, and training the concept of empathy. Great. Well, wonderful empathy uh, coming down to the end. And um, I have a, I like to ask every guest a story of grace. And Martin, I know you have one to share with us. So please tell us what it is. So, Well, I'm going to tell you a story uh, which certainly have had a profound impact on me and which I haven't talked a lot about until recently. Um, so uh, some time ago, I went to a wonderful Venezuela in Caracas, and um, and there I was kidnapped. It was part of my work. You know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but I've traveled around the world pretty extensively. You know, you're working. everywhere. <laughs> not really, but I've been in more than 80 countries, typically moving in in people's homes, spending time with them, understand their lifestyle, cook with them, shop with them, whatever. So I did go to Venezuela just recently and uh, was kidnapped. And I was with the... Um, with a kidnapper sitting there in a very dark room for for some days, and it was it was not a particular fun experience. But you know, as part of my job, I am fundamentally curious about people, not gossip wise, but to understand where they come from. And I fundamentally believe there's always something good in everyone. So, of course, this was the ultimate ethnographic opportunity for me to listen to them and hear what they were saying. So I interviewed them. And one of them were pretty okay at English. So we had a conversation back and forth, not for one day, but for three days. And in the end, after nearly three days, the guy says to me, um, do you know what? No one has int been interested about us. No one has listened to what we are all about. And remember, the average salary of a person in Venezuela these days is a dollar a month. Just to put it into perspective, the price of a Coca-Cola is a dollar. In Venezuela. So you can imagine how extraordinary poor it is and no one wanted to listen to them. So he said to me, listen, I'm going to give you the keys and you can walk out. Uh, and he threw the keys at me. I'll never forget it. I was sitting there and then I thought to myself, I don't want to leave. Um, and I don't know why I had that idea, but I had that idea. So I continued sitting there and I said, listen, you've given me the freedom. Thank you for that. But that's not the reason why I'm asking you these questions. It's because I really want to understand where you come from. So we actually spoke for the next 24 hours on and off. And after 24 hours, uh, I said, well, thank you. And then I left. And then as I walked out of the door, he said to me, you know, I would have shot you if you had left, right? I said, I know. But that's not the reason why I talk to you. And that's my grace. Wow, what a powerful story. Uh, Martin, thank you. How can people yes, find you? So, Well, it's super simple. It's martinlindstrom.com. Uh, and there you can find, you added this little pop-up coming up. So you can go into to my Ministry of Common Sense website. And there we have this uh, masterclass. It's called Off Methods. You know it very well, John, where we give everyone a free one-month um, subscription if you buy my book right now. Um, or else you can find me on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. And um, hopefully you can help me in bringing back common sense out there because it's desperately needed, right? It certainly is. Martin, it's been uh, wonderful to have you. Thank you. So Pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure too.